Please help me welcome Judge McKeithen. Wow, with a build-up like that, I guess I should just sit down and go home. You know, we can just go in and do something else. Um, J.D. Lambright has been a friend of mine for a long time, and he's uh, going to believe a word he says about me because he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's a good county attorney, but he doesn't know a thing about what he's talking about. Anyway. <laughs> I love that guy. He's a really good guy, by the way. And his wife, uh, Belinda, is one of my sweetest friends. I love her a lot. Um, I love her all lot. She's a great lady. Um, what in the world is an Ninth Court of Appeals and why in the world should you even care? That's what I was going to talk to you about. And some people think, doesn't he know? <laughs> He's the Chief Justice. Okay. I do know. The Ninth Court of Appeals is one of 14 courts of appeals in Texas that hears appeals, obviously, from the trial courts in the state. And in Montgomery County, we have eight district courts. We have five county courts of law. And any time a case is tried, either to the judge or to uh, a jury, uh, there's a winner and there's a loser. There's just no other way around it. You know, you know, when you're in a lawsuit, somebody wins and somebody loses. The one who loses oftentimes thinks, always thinks, that they should have won. So what do they do about that? They file an appeal. I mean, where does it go? It goes to the court in Beaumont. Now that's an interesting story too. Why in the world does Montgomery County go to the court in Beaumont? I mean, we're right, I mean, Harris County is right there. Why don't we just run down to Harris County? That's because when the court was created in 1915, there were three, there were, by that time there were eight courts of appeals. The original three were the first court of appeals. Where do you think that was located? Galveston, biggest city in Texas, 1897. Biggest city in Texas. They got the first court of appeals. Number two court of appeals, Fort Worth. Biggest cow town in the state. Yeah. Third court was Austin. Uh, at that time, everything from uh, Washington County all the way to uh, Sabine River, all the way up to uh, Hemp Hill, uh, just south of uh, the, the, the counties that border the Red River, those were all going to Galveston. Big territory, wasn't it? <laughs> when, uh, in 1915, the legislature created the Ninth Court of Appeals, the people of Montgomery County voted and said they didn't want to go to Galveston anymore. It just took too long to get there. It was hard to get there. It was a long, arduous journey. And you could just hop on the train in Conroe and go straight to Beaumont. Why should we do it that way? That's why the Ninth Court of Appeals <laughs> has Montgomery County in its jurisdiction, and I praise God for that because it's Montgomery County that has turned the Ninth Court of Appeals into a Republican stronghold, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but when it was created in 1915, there were three judges on the court. We had a constitutional, constitutional requirement that every court of appeals have a chief justice and two associate justices, period. That was what was in the Constitution. And we have uh, some strange anomalies that came from that. When the Houston Court of Appeals became just completely swamped, they created this thing called the Commission of Appeals to help them out. Well, that really didn't satisfy a lot of people because it really was kind of extra constitutional. It, there was really nothing in the Constitution that would give them jurisdiction or authority to hear appeals. So they had a brilliant idea. They created the 14th Court of Appeals for the Houston District that had the exact same territorial boundaries and jurisdiction of the first Court of Appeals. But they also had three judges, a Chief Justice and two associates. So it, in a essence, Houston got six judges for their appeals. And they stayed that way for quite some time until we had a constitutional amendment in 69, I believe, that changed the language in the Constitution. And now it says, a court of appeals shall consist of a chief justice and at least two associate justices. By this point, we had about six or eight years of two different courts in Houston, and now we have two chief justices in Houston, and neither one of them really wanted to give it up, so they did. 
Well, now we have two courts of appeals in Houston that have nine justices on each court. And every year we go to the legislature, and every year the legislature says, we're going to change that. And every year the legislature does not. <laughs> uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of politics involved in that. Uh, as there isn't everything. <laughs> well, the only reason we have a 12th Court of Appeals is because then, the then Speaker of the House wanted one in Tyler, and we didn't, he didn't have one. So he cut some out of Texarkana, and he cut some out of Dallas, and he cut some out of the 9th, and he created the 12th Court of Appeals, which I guess if you're the Speaker of the House, you can do a lot of stuff. <laughs> Um, we, uh, when the uh, court was first formed in 1915, we went from 1915 until 2000 without having a single Republican serve in that court. Not one, ever. Even Bill Clements uh, appointed a Democrat to sit on the court when there was a vacancy because you just couldn't find a Republican that would do it. There weren't any Republicans in Jefferson County, and there are darn few now. But and, and when Bill Clements was our governor, and he appointed actually my predecessor in 1989, he couldn't find a Republican that would take it, because they knew as soon as there was an election, they'd be gone. Montgomery County was kind of small potatoes in this district back then. That has changed considerably. In 2000, uh, we had an open seat. Uh, the, uh, one of the Democrats on the court decided not to run, and a fellow named David Galtney, uh, a lawyer in uh, Jefferson County, decided to run, and he ran as a Republican. And he beat the Democrat who was from the Woodlands, by the way. I don't know if y'all remember that little history. He was a Democrat who ran, uh, who lived here in the Woodlands, and he thought that that would make it okay. Everybody would go ahead and vote for him since he really lived in the Woodlands, and then everybody would know he was pretty conservative anyway. It didn't work. The people in the Woodlands and all over Montgomery County voted for David Galtney because he really is a Republican and he was not ashamed to admit it and so he got elected. That was the first Republican to sit on that court in 85 years. David Galtney spent two years writing a ton of dissents. <laughs> What's a dissent? Every case is heard in three judge panels on the Court of Appeals. So you got to get two votes before you can issue an opinion, before you can send out a mandate saying this is what the law is. We, we are telling you this is the law. You've got to have two votes. Uh, it was easy to get two votes because the two Democrats always voted alike, and poor David uh, was voting, was writing a lot of dissents. Now, dissents are important when you have to write one because many times when the parties appeal the Court of Appeals decision to the Supreme Court of Texas, the Supreme Court of Texas will look at that dissent and that will help the Supreme Court decide whether or not they're going to grant the appeal. And if they do grant the appeal, many times they adopt, not verbatim, I wish I could say that, but the, many times they will adopt the arguments and the, and the uh, logic that is in the uh, dissent and use it in their Supreme Court majority opinion. So the dissenting opinions can be very important. In 2002, uh, I decided to run for the Court of Appeals, uh, put my law practice on hold. I can tell you a story about that, but I want it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, let's put it this way. In 2001, I made a lot of money as a lawyer. In 2002, I didn't <laughs> because I was spending all my time campaigning. And uh, it paid off, obviously. Uh, the folks in Montgomery County were very good to me. The folks in the Woodlands were very good to me. The folks in uh, most of the counties were very good to me, with about three exceptions. Jefferson, you know, I got about 32% of the vote in Jefferson County. And my opponent got the other 68. How bad was it? How bad was it? On the night of the election, the Beaumont Examiner, which is the, really the only major newspaper in Jefferson County anymore, had a big headline below the fold. McKeithen may oust Walker. Walker was the Democrat I was running against. Well, at that point, I had a 17,000 vote lead, and two precincts were out. <laughs> I, guess, I guess they were hoping that there was a lot of dead people in those two precincts that they could get to the polls by the morning. Uh, it was a terrible shock to their system. They just couldn't stand the idea. And, and Judge Walker, he had been the Chief Justice for two full terms. He had been a district judge in Jefferson County. His wife was the uh, county clerk. 
his son was running as a district for a district judge bench in Jefferson County, and he won. And so it was a, quite a shock to those folks. They didn't know, they didn't know you existed, uh, and you showed them you do. It was a, quite a surprise. That left only one Democrat on our court. The day I went in to say hello and introduce myself to him, he looked at me and said, "I'm not running for re-election." I said, "Really? You're not?" He said, "Nope. I can count." <laughs> so when you elected me, you in effect elected two Republicans because the only re remaining Democrat didn't even file to run for re-election, and no Democrat filed. The next time we had an election, the, the Republican ran unopposed. Another first in the history of that court. It's just in six short years that court went from nothing but Democrats to nothing but Republicans. We now have four judges on our court because of the workload. There is a, not a requirement, there's a, a legislative um, goal of all judges on the courts of appeals to not do more than 160 cases a year. So in order to do that, you have to have you know, some type of system that you can transfer a few cases out or move some judges around. Well, in 2004, a four-judge court in El Paso had a judge who was retiring. El Paso has always been a court that cases have been transferred into because they never had enough work to do. How they got four, that's probably some other political thing that I don't know about. But when she decided to retire, Tommy Williams carried a bill that would just do away with that position and create a new position on our court. So we got another judge on our court with the staff to support that judge at no cost to taxpayers. It was a wonderful coup. A lot of folks out in West Texas didn't think so, but uh, those of us over here were very pleased to have that because it, we were transferring over 35% of our cases out to other courts of appeals because we were just overwhelmed. At that point, we went down to only 5% of our cases being transferred out. We got our fourth judge. Uh, I hate to have to tell you, but we're now back up to almost 30% of our cases being transferred out. We really need to get a fifth judge. But there's no way to do it without uh, adding a judge because there's nowhere to take it away from anymore. So that would cost money, and the uh, legislature is very averse to spending money when you don't absolutely have to, which is a good thing. I'm not complaining. That's a good thing. Uh, so we're going to have to wait for our fifth judge and just uh, continue to transfer some of our cases to the other courts of appeals. So that's kind of what the Ninth Court of Appeals is. Okay, now why should you care? Why should you care? And so I look out here and see you folks, I'm betting, I'd be very safe in betting this, I'm not a really gambler, but I would bet 95% of you at least voted for people that you believe are conservatives who will go to Austin and vote in a conservative manner the conservative philosophy. I bet a lot of you worked for them, prayed for them, and did just about everything you could to get them elected. And you were very successful, by the way. And I congratulate you for that. And that's good. But if you stop there, if you didn't consider who sits on the Court of Appeals, and what kind of people there are up there, then you might have wasted your vote. You might have wasted your time. You might have wasted your efforts. Because it's the people in the Court of Appeals that have to interpret the new laws that get enacted by the legislature. We don't always like to do that, but we have to. You know, when a lawsuit's filed and an appeal comes from that, and it's based on a brand new statute that nobody's ever done anything with before, and nobody has any background or any, any cases we can look at to tell us what the legislature meant, we have to decide what we believe the legislature meant. Well, you remember I told you about the three judges that were all Democrats? In 1998, there were 39 cases appealed out of the Ninth Court of Appeals District. The Supreme Court granted the writ and took the appeal. How many of those cases would you guess the Supreme Court reversed in that one year? All 39. <laughs> Every single one of the cases that the Supreme Court granted an appeal for, they had to reverse. Okay, now, now, how can that possibly happen? Two ways. 
two ways that could happen. One, you have a bunch of idiots on the Court of Appeals who don't know the law, or they're just incompetent, or they just don't care, they don't want to learn, they don't want to figure it out, they don't want to research it, so they just write anything. Anyway. That's one way it could happen. The other way it could happen is that you have judges on that court that have an agenda, and their agenda is to help their friends, who were at the time personal injury trial lawyers, who gave them a lot, a lot, lots of money to keep their jobs. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you which one it was because I don't really know exactly. But it can only be one of those two things. So does it matter who sits on the courts of appeals in this state? Man, it, I can't tell you how much it matters. Because when you have judges that understand their role is to interpret the laws as closely as they possibly can to what the legislature intended for that law to mean, then you are way ahead of the game. We save money, we save uh, grief, you say people in businesses, they, they're able to continue and get their businesses back on track. You know, when you end up in an appeal, and you have a business that's involved in that appeal, you, you might be on hold for a year or two or three. And if you have to do that time and time and time again, because the people on the courts of appeals have some kind of agenda to help a certain group, what good does it do to vote for people who are conservative and go to the legislature and... and do your will. It's extremely important to take a good look at who you have on your courts of appeals and make sure those people understand their role. Now, there's been a couple of times, more than that, there have been several times when I didn't like where I had to go when I wrote my opinion. I didn't like it at all. It was very difficult to write an opinion that went the direction I had to take it. But that was the law. And I made one promise when I ran in 02 and again in 08. I will follow the law. If it kills me, no matter where it goes, if that's what the legislature intended, that's where I'll go. And if you want somebody who will fix things that the legislature didn't do right, and, and sometimes they, sometimes it would be nice if you know somebody could fix some of the stuff they do, but if that's what you want, you don't want me. Because that's not what I see as my job. It's to interpret the law based on what the legislature intended when they wrote it. And if that's what you want, well, then you got it already. So um, that's why you should care. And uh, I think I'm going to let you ask questions now. I think I'm running.